I've taken the time to study the All-22 from the Buffalo Bills preseason win over the Chicago Bears, and I'm sharing my top takeaways today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. I want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Well, folks, spent uh, Sunday night into Monday morning studying the Bills versus Bears all twenty-two coaches film, and I got a lot to say about what my eyes saw and my biggest takeaways from studying the tape. Like I've been telling you over the last couple of these all 22 review episodes, I always love giving you my immediate reaction to football games. We're always going to do that here, but it's really cool when I have the time to study the film and then come back to you with some of the big takeaways that I have from really understanding the game and what happened and you know where players looked good and where players really kind of had some struggles. And sometimes these episodes will follow me discussing some of the big narratives that form from the game. You know, things that the Bills maybe as a team struggled with, we could talk about the why. And sometimes it's going to be like today where there's not a lot of big narratives about the game in terms of, you know, getting clarity on what happened. This is just going to be a lot of my, I guess I would call them scouting notes from really studying the players. And now that I've done this for a couple of weeks, I've seen a lot of reps of these players. I'm getting more and more familiar with their skill sets and what they do, and I just understand them better. And that leads to what I think are some really good conversations that we can have on these All-22 Review discussions. And so let's do that today. We're going to focus in to start on the offensive line, get into some stuff on Dalton Kincaid and Justin Shorter, and I want to talk about the defense. So let's let's get into this, and let's do start with the offensive line. we got a, an extended opportunity to watch the group um, not only for a series with Josh Allen, but for a good amount of uh, the time that Kyle Allen was on the field. And so I want to kind of focus on some of my biggest notes from the offensive line. And I do want to start with Osiris Torrance, who has been one of the biggest points of focus for me in studying the Bills game film, because obviously he's a second round rookie. He's going to start at right guard. And I want to really gauge his skill set and understand what the Bills are going to ask him to do. And so I thought this game against the Bears was outstanding in terms of the run game. I mean, there were some moments in this football game where he was able to really create big-time displacement. And what I mean when I say displacement is moving bodies out of the way, displacing a defender from the gap they're responsible for. And you saw that quite a bit. And I was really impressed with his chemistry with Spencer Brown in the run game and with Mitch Morris in the run game playing on either side of him working combos, getting to the second level. It's all very good in terms of timing. And really, you know, the part of his game that I didn't expect to be as solid as it is, is is what he's doing when he's climbing to the second level and having to block linebackers. He's taking good angles. He has good timing. He's playing under good control. And it's hard if you're a bigger offensive lineman to get to the second level and connect with moving targets. But Osiris Torrance is doing a really nice job of that. Now, I will say this game was his biggest test yet in pass protection. Not that he hasn't faced good pass rushers to this point, but I felt like Justin Jones, who he went up against quite a bit, had some wins against him and really put some tape out there that I think will be good for Osiris Torrance to learn from and uh, be mindful of some of the ways that these defensive tackles are going to attack him. And so I thought he had a couple of losses in pass protection. The first loss was an overset. 
And what I mean by an overset is, you know, he's opening into his kick slide and he's trying to get a lot of width and a lot of depth in that kick slide. And that really kind of opened up an opportunity for Justin Jones to plant and then cross his face and work that interior gap. And so Osiris Torrance is opening one way a little too much, not protecting that inside gap. And Justin Jones was able to really cross his face and create some very good a gap pressure on a particular rep. Actually, it was the the play where Josh Allen rolled to his right and hit Gabe Davis across the middle. You can kind of see that if you go back and watch the game. That's the play that I'm talking about where it was just very difficult for him to, to redirect, right? It was hard for him to redirect. Now, part of that was very good timing with Justin Jones and his pass rush, but also Osiris Torrance just getting a little bit too wide, opening those hips a little bit too wide and creating a, a challenging position for him to redirect and work back inside. The other loss that he had in pass protection was actually the Kyle Allen interception. Uh, Justin Jones did a little stutter set, stutter step, had a head fake, and then did the same type of thing where he crossed his face and got that inside edge to create pressure. Now, this one wasn't as much of an overset for Osiris Torrance as it was stressing his foot speed to be able to redirect and close down that gap. And so I, I think if there's a, a trend that I've noticed in terms of where Osiris Torrance really needs to improve, it's that ability to redirect and understand when guys are going to try to cross his face and work the A-gap and set, in the, set up those inside moves, he's got to be a little more springy to work back inside, get his hands on guys, and really you know, move. He's got he's to move his feet and, and get those guys washed washed inside, right? Take them where they want to go more than they want to get there. And that's what, that's where he'll find some success. You've seen that happen from time to time, but if there's a little chink in the armor right now as it relates to those, the Osiris Torrance, I think that's that's the thing to be mindful of. And the bottom line here is he's got a big test. Week one, his NFL debut, if you will, New York Jets, Quinn and Williams. Quinn and Williams, one of the best defensive tackles in all of football, probably one of the best five for sure. I uh, had like 12 and a half sacks last year. He's healthy and he's a problem. And so I'm sure Quinn and Williams, I mean, he's <laughs> he's unbelievably quick, right? So this is going to be a big time challenge for Osiris Torrance in that first game. And if I'm Osiris, I'm preparing myself to redirect and really be able to do my best to handle that speed that Quinn and Williams is going to present to him. Let's talk about David Edwards, who started at left guard in this game. And uh, Connor McGovern is out with a knee injury. And it's a knee injury that I think could uh, linger for a few weeks into the regular season. And that means David Edwards will have to start a few games. And I think that's okay. David Edwards is a NFL starter in my mind. And the Bills are very fortunate to have him as a reserve. In fact, the interior offensive line depth is really, really strong. Even when you get past David Edwards, you still got Ryan Bates there as a depth player on the interior. And so the Bills are in good shape on the interior. But David Edwards is going to have to probably start at left guard next to Deion Dawkins and, and Mitch Morse. And I thought the pass protection for David Edwards was really, really strong, really strong. His ability to anchor, mirror, play with extension, it's all very strong. Where I thought David Edwards really struggled quite a bit was the run game. He was very uh, hit or miss. And, and not that he was on the field for a ton of run blocking snaps, in fact, only six. But on those six snaps where he was run blocking, it was pretty clear that there were timing issues with him and especially Deion Dawkins, where you know they're working combo blocks and they're just they don't feel each other well. You know, when you combo and scoop to the second level, you have to be able to secure that and make sure that the that the guy that you're comboing with can get his hips around and re, and and secure that first level before you release to the second level. Saw some issues with him and Dawkins with that one time on a zone block where David Edwards just completely whiffed on his block, and you know James Cook probably would have broke a nice run, but. David Edwards didn't block anybody, and it was just not good zone awareness for him. A little bit of uh, heavy feet there working laterally as well on some of those wide zone concepts. So I think getting some reps here in practice over the coming days as the Bills get ready for the Jets is going to be important for the run game, for him to get some timing down and uh, have some better results. Right? We talk about offensive line being uh, five guys working together as one. I think you you saw this game and you realized that David Edwards was the guy that hadn't really worked with this group quite as much um, when watching that game against the Bears. So uh, just shoring up his timing and understanding of his role in the run game, I think, is going to be important for David Edwards. 
On Spencer Brown, I thought he was fine in this game. Uh, wasn't a standout performance by any means, but th- I think he just continues to challenge or be challenged with his gravitational pull. And what I mean by that is some blockers just have this ability to just suck guys in, right, and get their hands latched, and then that's it for that defender. With, with Spencer Brown, it just isn't there, right? There's a lot of air, uh, and, and let me explain that. As an offensive tackle, a lot of times you want to take the air out of pass protection, close down those distances, clamp guys, and really keep them at bay. And, and Spencer kind of has some challenges with that. And I, I think it stems from uh, a narrow build and uh, some very, very inconsistent timing and placement with his hands. And that leads to some soft edges and some challenges for him. Now, he played fine in this game. He gave up one pressure on 18 pass block snaps, but there's a vulnerability uh, that continues to show up. And the Bears don't have this deep array of pass rushers, right? It's it's probably one of the worst defensive lines in the entire league. And so he's going to be challenged by some much better pass rushers um, than what the Bears have to throw at him. And I think he'll be challenged in some new ways. And so he was fine in this game, but there's just issues with hands. There's issues with leverage and bend that I think will be exposed differently by other opponents. And so, you know, look, I'm hopeful on Spencer Brown, but I I just worry if that timing, his leverage, his bend is always going to be kind of an issue for him. But We'll obviously monitor him the rest of the way. All right, I got more to say about the offensive line. Actually, quite a bit more to say about the offensive line. But first, I need to tell you about game time. Buying tickets to your favorite sporting events or whatever event you want to attend, it shouldn't be stressful, but sometimes it is. Well, good thing game time exists. It is the fast and easiest way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. They've got killer deals on last-minute tickets. They have a best price guarantee. And so you can stop stressing over getting the tickets and start getting excited for the fun that you're going to have. Folks, the Game Time app is awesome. They have flash deals. Like I mentioned, last-minute tickets. They give you an image of seat views, right, so you know exactly what it's going to look like when you get to the venue. And everything on the app is super easy to navigate. Also, they they have um, this deal where they send it right to your phone, right? You don't have to dig through emails. So you buy a ticket sent right to your phone. You don't have to dig through the emails to find it. It is fantastic. And did I mention that I love the last-minute ticket deals? You don't have to plan months in advance. They have deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. So snag tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Lockdown NFL for twenty bucks off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Lockdown NFL for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, let's get back to these offensive line notes. Uh, let's get to Alec Anderson. Alec Anderson, a player that I think has a good chance of making this roster. And um, his versatility has been impressive, but I think probably no more than it was against the Bears. He had eight snaps at right tackle, 15 at right guard, and 22 at center. I mean, playing all the spots there, that goes a long way in your ability to stick on an NFL roster. And so for Anderson as a UDFA out of UCLA, um, I think showing that versatility is really, really important for his chances. And I'll say this, watching him on the inside, he's just more comfortable. And I, when I say inside, I mean guard and center. Much more comfortable working both phases, uh, being run blocking and pass blocking. He looks pretty solid on the inside. His tackle snaps, he only had eight of them at right tackle. I thought those were a little bit more inconsistent, right? He's got some challenges there. He's got early hands and he got overextended a little bit. And to me, that's a signal of a guy that's best suited to play on the inside, trying to get by on the outside because on the inside at garden center, things just happen a little bit faster, right? You got to get your hands on quicker. There's less space. You're playing more in a phone booth where when you're at tackle, you're a little bit more on an Island. You're facing better athletes on the edge and you have to have a little bit more patience about yourself where Alec Anderson, you see him setting, he's kind of antsy, he's getting his hands out quick, and I th- I thought that led to some challenges, right? He gave up a sack, uh, gave up another pressure, and so just not the level of comfort. So I think you can maybe call him functional in an emergency at tackle, but very clearly when I watch Alec Anderson, I feel like he's a guy that's best suited to play on the inside. Uh, let's talk about Ryan Vandemark for a moment here. This is my last off- offensive line note, and then we'll move on. I had 35 snaps in this game at right tackle. Good experience for him. 
We've talked about Ryan Vandemark quite a bit. The level of comfort for him, especially in pass protection, is just much greater on the left side. The run blocking is solid on either side, but as a pass blocker where I think muscle memory and just the the consistency of like how you're repped and how you move matters a lot more in pass protection, and he's just better on the left side. Uh, I, I would just say he's more coordinated when playing left tackle as opposed to right tackle. And, you know, he's got that big, long athletic frame, but when he has to redirect on, on the right side, I think it's just a little less natural for him. He's not as repped there and it shows. And so not that we haven't uncovered this already, but it's another affirmation. He got extended look at right tackle 35 reps. And um, it's just not a spot where I see a great deal of comfort for him. I feel very good about him playing left tackle though but the right side continues to be a challenge for Ryan Vandemark. But good good experience for him getting those reps on the right side. I thought one of the other interesting notes here from this game is that we got an idea of what the Bills' offense when it comes to quick passing game will look like. Uh, I thought both quarterbacks, Josh Allen and Kyle Allen, both got the ball out of their hands pretty quick. Uh, Josh Allen, 2.53 seconds average time to throw. Kyle Allen, 2.43 average uh time to throw in terms of seconds there. And so the guys got the ball out of their hands quick, and you saw some very intentional moments with that. It wasn't um, a ton of, or it wasn't always, you know, five, seven step drops, progression style passing where you have to pick out matchups, read defense, and then go go somewhere with the football. There was some manufactured throws, uh, especially to Deontay Hardy on a lot of those quick outs. Uh, you saw some RPO stuff, but, you know, the reason you know that it's intentional is how quick the drops are, but also there's cut blocking with the offensive line. You saw the offensive tackles cut block quite a bit. And the reason cut blocking is you want to kind of chop down a defensive lineman on at their, at their knees. And the point there is you want to prevent them from getting their hands up into throwing lanes because the ball is coming out quick and it's coming out to a short, a short area of the field. And so you cut block, you get those hands down and that creates the throwing windows. And I saw some cut blocking at a higher level of frequency than I typically would from the bills passing game. And so, as we talk about quick passes, getting the ball out of quarterback's hands quicker, easy button throws for Josh Allen, you saw some of that baked into this football game, and I'm sure a lot of us are going to be excited to see that moving forward, in addition to all the fun stuff that Josh Allen likes to do, pushing the ball down the field. We also got our first extended look uh, at Knox and Kincaid together in this game. You know, uh, uh, Knox was not available last week, has the finger injury, uh, but he's back and playing um, and then in week one, I mean, they barely played a few snaps. So we got a little bit of an opportunity to see an extended opportunity with those guys on the field. And you could tell the Bills smartly um, gave a lot of the the dirty work reps to Dawson Knox, the inline stuff, the play side blocking, having to block defensive ends, just a little bit more on his plate as a blocker, which makes sense. I mean, that's going to be where Dawson is stronger than Dalton. And so you want to see him do those types of things. And on one hand, you can see the the Bills leaning into Dawson Knox to do that, but also you can see them being a little bit hesitant to ask Dalton and K- Kincaid to do a lot of that, which makes sense. I mean, Kincaid, blocking is always going to be a part of what he does, but what's going to move the needle is what he can do in the passing game. And one of the notes that I have with him and just watching him in this game and even being mindful of the last couple of games, he, he's very he's a very outstanding, talented pass catcher, but he's being challenged quite a bit, especially in this Bears game, more more than any game yet. He's challenged. He's being challenged with physicality early in those routes. So he's releasing and getting to you know to that second level, that B level of the defense. Linebackers are looking to get their hands on him and be physical and really redirect and reroute him. Uh, you know, just a couple steps into his route stems, and so that's that's been a little bit of a challenge for him. You know, I think he's got to really work on how he addresses and beats that contact. It's not always bad. But there are times where he kind of gets hung up. There's times where he has to work overtime to clear that contact. And you need him to stay on schedule, right? And and part of staying on schedule is beating that contact so that he can get to his landmarks and make himself available for the quarterback. Um, And so that's something to be mindful of as we continue to watch Dalton Kincaid grow as a player. Um, That ability to fight through that second level contact to stay uh, on top of his route timing is going to be really important. And, And I'm sure. You know, that's going to come a lot in the regular season. You know, I mean, their teams are going to know what Dalton Kincaid can do, and part of their plan is going to be hands on. You know, I've, I've talked to uh, an NFL linebacker one time, and he told me about whenever they faced, uh, you know, these the good tight ends, their, their entire philosophy is hands on, hands on, hands on. 
you saw that happen in this game against Dalton Kincaid. And so I, I'm sure Rob Boris is keenly aware of this, but developing that ability to beat that early contact is going to be critical for Dalton Kincaid to maximize his ability to produce for the Bills. Uh, really enjoyed watching Damian Harris in this football game. Uh, eight snaps. He carried the ball on seven of those eight snaps. In fact, his, his he was productive, obviously, at the touchdown run. Uh, but his most explosive run was taken away on a holding call by David Questenberry. The Bills only had two penalties in the game. That was one of them. And, folks, there's no there's no planet where that was a hold on, on David Questenberry. I, I sent that out to the subtext community right after it happened. I said, I don't think that was a hold. I watched the tape. It's definitely not a hold. Uh, but took away his most exciting play. Now, fortunately for the Bills, the next play was a Q Moore's touchdown. So it, it, you know, it was a bit of a wash there. But you'd hate to see Harris lose his best play on a holding call that not only had nothing to do with the result of the play, was also not holding. But the, the greater point that I want to get to here with, with Damian Harris is I'm excited about his skill set. And I'm excited about him with Latavius Murray. And of course, I'm excited about James Cook, but this skill set, this downhill physical runner, it's an element to the Bills offense that has just been missing. You were you were hopeful that it could have been Zach Moss, and it wasn't. I mean, last year your lead ball carriers were Devin Singletary and, and James Cook. That's not a that's not downhill physical bruising backs, right? Those are shifty, elusive guys that can make guys miss in tight spaces and have some wiggle to them. You know, Damian Harris, he's a guy that runs with very low pads. He runs with good forward lean. He's powerful. He's physical. Uh, he's very square to the line of scrimmage. That was something that really popped for me when watching Damian Harris is how quickly he can get himself to square his pads when he's about to take on contact. And, you know, Sean McDermott said something uh, in his postgame press conference, I think the day after, where he said, you can feel his pad level. I resonate with what Sean's saying there. If you watch him play, there is just a uh, an urgency and a physicality and just a no-nonsense approach to the way he carries the football. And you pair this guy with Latavius Murray, and the Bills not only have one guy, but have two guys that they didn't have in the past that can really bring this physical downhill element that's going to matter in short yardage. It's going to matter late in games when you're trying to wear teams down and get out of football games that you have a lead with. And um, I'm excited about those two guys working with with James Cook in the backfield here. All right, folks, I want to talk about Justin Shorter, Tyrell Dotson, and some other defensive notes right after a quick break. Stick with me. All right, folks, we got more to get to here today, but before we do, I would like to invite you to join the Locked On Bills subtext community, something that we started offering a few months ago, and it has been awesome. Uh, there's a link to join in the show notes for today. Uh, you get a lot with uh, joining the Locked On Bills subtext community. One-on-one -on -one text conversations with me. I could be a text message away, direct line. We could talk Bills football uh, whenever something comes to your mind. I also send out regular texts, usually at least one every day, just thoughts on the Bills, what's going to happen with the podcast, programming notes, all that type of stuff. Uh, so that's really cool. We've done uh, some live in-game texting where I'm sharing my – thoughts as they come up as I'm watching the game, sending out mass text messages to everybody. Uh, so that's been cool. I've got a lot of good feedback on that. We've done some uh, some giveaways as well. We'll do more of that. You get my first reaction to all major Bills news. So there's a lot going on there. Check it out. There's a link to join in the show notes for today. So if you're watching on YouTube or wherever you're consuming this podcast, check out the show notes, click on the link. Everyone gets a, a free two-week trial. Check it out. I think you'll have fun. And um, as I've said before, there's nothing that changes with the normal delivery of this podcast. Simply an extra layer of engagement for anybody who might want it. All right, let's talk about Justin Shorter. And folks, it was a rough day for Justin Shorter. Thought it was a rough day when I watched the game live, and it was definitely a rough game when I watched it uh, back. He had five targets in the game, two drops. I mean, two just legitimate, didn't catch the football when he should have caught the football. Another... Uh, was a missed opportunity to make an adjustment on the ball. Uh, kind of, I don't know if he picked it up late or he didn't want to move or he was mindful of some contact that was coming, but just failed to make any adjustment to a football that I thought he could. There was another uh, target that was incomplete where I, I don't think he fought hard enough to win positioning at the catch point, which is not what you want to hear from like, what is he, six, four? I don't, it's, he's tall and big and physical. And I expect tall, big, physical receivers to compete better at the catch point than what I saw 
on that rep. So five targets, two drops, didn't make an adjustment, another where he couldn't win body positioning. And then, of course, he had one catch for 19 yards, which was a there's a good route combination, a clear out. He was able to have a deep in, sit down, catch the football, nice, uh, easy route, throw, catch. All that was good. But I thought there were some missed opportunities there for him to make more plays. And then he was part of the equation on the long kick return by the Bears. Him, Balin Specter, and Cameron Klein, the, that trio of guys uh, got kind of crossed up, couldn't get off blocks, and didn't didn't make the tackle when they had the opportunity to do it. Um, and so just an all-around very rough game for Justin Shorter. And I think I think that's just kind of the experience that you're going to have with him at this point. And, you know, you, you've been wondering, well, this guy's an athletic, physical freak specimen, number one receiver coming out of high school. Why didn't he produce more? Well, here you go. I mean, just compare the notes that I've had on Justin Shorter all three weeks uh, so far in the preseason. And I think that uh, that's the experience as it relates to Justin Shorter. Obviously, a young player, uh, plenty of room for growth, but just not a great showcase for him against the Bears. All right, let's get to defense. Let's get to Tyrell Dotson. I know that that's a, a big topic of conversation for everyone. Here's what I'll say about Tyrell Dotson from this game. And of course, this is going to be mindful of all the Tyrell Dotson that I've watched. He's a perfectly fine downhill player. If you want him to play downhill, tackle, defend the run, he is fine. I don't want to say he's great. He's fine. He's passable. Coverage is just a major issue, though. He's not a good coverage player. He's not comfortable. He doesn't get to his landmarks. Uh, he doesn't feel routes, right? There's there's a, an element of zone coverage where it's a lot of it's based on feel and understanding where the eligible players are, what routes are coming, and and. Uh, based on what certain guys do, what the likely other route combinations are, and then getting to spaces where you can cut off routes and take players off the menu. That's just not comfortable for him. And so I feel like this is going to be, if he's going to be your starting Mike linebacker, coverage is going to be a, a perpetual problem all season long. And one of the theories that I've seen out there from people discussing Tyrell Dotson is, well, maybe he'll be more effective when the Bills are actually game planning, right, for opponents, right? They're, they're aware of tendencies. They're going to put players in positions to be successful. And, of course, when you're running the full breadth of your scheme, right, you know, things are vanilla in preseason, and that's really not going to allow guys to go out and be the best player that they can be. But it is about execution. But I would counter with this. I hear you. That's Those are good points. What about when the other team's doing the same thing? When the other team's keenly aware that 53 is out there in the middle of the field, you are going to flood the middle of the field. You're going to challenge his ability to read, react, and get to his spots. And other teams are going to be licking their chops to attack this guy in coverage. He's not a player you can hide. You can't just hide him out there. And I think you're going to see issues all year with him not getting enough depth, not reacting quick enough. You know, he's, he's a guy that uh, the play action stuff, I know it's hard. Play action is hard if you're a linebacker. And and most teams you're to, you're 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 taught to to play the run first. So you play the run first, and then you get back. Well, Dotson doesn't necessarily feel that well, and he doesn't have the explosiveness to work laterally or work in his back pedal to get back to his landmarks. And balls are getting completed over his head left and right. With Jermaine Edmonds back there, you've got six five with thirty five inch arms and a ton of athleticism, which which allows you to get out of those conflicts better. So Dodson's a slow to react player without good athleticism. And, and to me, like gr I love the downhill ability. That's, that's great. You're passable there. The NFL is about passing the football and stopping the pass. And Tyrell Dodson is a liability in coverage. All right. With that out of the way, let's talk about the defensive line a little bit. Defensive tackle rotation was interesting in this game. The first series at Oliver Daquan Jones, the next series at Oliver Jordan Phillips. So welcome back, Jordan Phillips. We got a chance to see him play. Not on the field a ton. He was on the, out there for nine snaps, but he did get early snaps. I thought he looked solid. Not that he made plays or anything like that, but he was where he was supposed to be in his gaps. But I thought the biggest prevailing thought that I had with Jordan Phillips is that quickness was there. And it's been a while since I've seen that athleticism. That's you know, that's something about Jordan Phillips. He's a big, explosive dude, like 340 pounds and has good burst. And last year with the hamstring injury early, the shoulder, you know, you didn't see that from him. So it was good to see him being able to to have that explosiveness that makes him a, a good player. And, and that was nice to see in the limited amount of snaps that we saw him. Uh, one note that I felt like I, I just completely missed when talking about the game uh, on this podcast and even watching the game live 
was the very first play of the game on defense for the Bills. Amazing run stop from Ed Oliver. Stood up Cody Whitehair, uh, was able to disengage and make a tackle for like no gain, maybe even a slight loss on it. Uh, so that was an impressive play. I was, I, I know the, I, my excuse for not catching that live was uh, I was really concerned with that first play and who was on the field. So I remember like writing down, okay, Boogie Basham's out there, and, uh, Christian Benford, all this stuff. I'm taking notes and I, I kind of missed like the, the sequence of what actually happened with the play. But at Oliver uh, looking strong on that rep. The defensive end rotation early was interesting as well. It started off uh, with Greg Rousseau and Boogie Basham. And um, I'll stop there. Boogie Basham, really strong performance. This guy's had a great preseason. Um, the thing that's really popped for me when studying Boogie this preseason is that his hand usage and his pass rush arsenal is way better. It has absolutely grown quite a bit. I'm seeing him use his hands and set up set up his rush better than I ever have. There's absolute growth there. And so I'm excited to see what Boogie can do in year three. I'm not expecting him to like become this all world player, but can he become a meaningful piece of this rotation? I think he can. Uh, so I'm really, really satisfied with, with where Boogie's at. Um, but after it was Rousseau and Basham for that quick three and out, it was then Rousseau and Leonard Floyd. And I've gotten some questions about Leonard Floyd, you know, just not a whole lot going on this preseason. And it's been a quiet preseason for Leonard Floyd. He played 12 snaps in the first game, eight snaps in the second game, and then 11 snaps against the Bears. I think the Bills are saving a lot of what the vision is for him for the season. Because if I go back to training camp Leonard Floyd and the practices I was there and what I came back and shared with you, this guy was all over the place. you know. And I, I think that there's a whole lot more that they're going to have him do. They're not showing you it right now. I think that's one of my big takeaways in watching this these preseason games and comparing it to what camp practices look like. I think they're very deliberate with kind of being being a little bit reserved with how they deploy Leonard Floyd. I think you're going to see a lot more from him during the regular season. Uh, some quick notes on the defensive backs that I want to make uh, before we get out of here. Uh, Saran Neal, I thought he was the best defensive player on the field for either team. I mean, the guy balled out, pass breakups in the end zone, two of them, some big-time tackles in space, playing fast, physical. You felt Saran Neal out there when you watch a game live and you felt him on the All-22. He was really good. Uh, Christian Benford, um, we talked all about the PBU, that great rep against DJ Moore on the third down, stayed in phase, completely on an island, great great job staying leveraged and winning at the catch point. But then he had another great tackle and uh, an outstanding open field tackle on Justin Fields. And so, you know, just checking boxes, doing his job and pressing. Cam Lewis, lights out performance, physical game for him. Really enjoyed watching him as well as Jamarcus Ingram. He had the interception in the game, which was pretty much gift wrapped. But I thought he was physical and, and fulfilled his assignments extremely well. Jamarcus Ingram, really nice young defensive back in terms of developmental guy. You know, no real hype for him coming out of college. Practice squad, nice development. If the Bills needed to lean on Jamarcus Ingram at any point this year, uh, I think they'll be very fortunate to have him on the practice squad. Damar Hamlin, good performance, two good physical run stops, had another big open field tackle, which was really impressive. He uh, was had to come across the field, took a good angle, and work back across the field on a misdirection play that he was the last line of the fence. I thought it was a great rep from Damar playing physical. I, I, if he gets a roster spot, he absolutely earned it. And then I'll say this about Kyer Elam. He played late into the game. He played against third stringers, but he played well. He was in phase and coverage, tackled when he needed to, physical, had some good moments in press coverage. Kyer Elam is a, a fine football player, and it's disheartening that he can't beat out Christian Benford. I think Christian, Christian Benford's earned that, but I don't think it's not because Kyer Elam is a lost cause. I think Kyer Elam is a fine football player, um, but him not beating out Christian Benford says more about Christian Benford than it does about Kyer Elam. And so it, this, we, what we have to be careful of with Kyer Elam and the entire conversation there is that it, it's not like he's this complete failure as a football player that can't perform. He can. It's just that he's not better than Christian Benford, and you're only playing one CB2. So that's something to be mindful of. I, I'm curious to see how things evolve there because I don't think he's a lost cause. And I, and of course, there's a caveat that he's doing this against third stringers. But it's more about Christian Benford. So let's make it about Christian Benford. Obviously, a great draft pick, great scouting work. And the, the coaching staff has developed him well, and he's earned it. 
And so we'll see how it all unfolds, but let's just have the right perspective on Kyrie Elam because he's not a lost cause. He's not a, a guy that can't play. He just can't beat out Christian Benford. All right, folks, there you have it. All 22 review on the Chicago Bears. Our next conversation is probably going to be reflecting on the Bills' cuts. Uh, we're expecting them to come, well, they have to come before 4 o'clock on Tuesday. And so once those cuts are announced, we will respond to all of that. I'm going to go live on Bleacher Report as soon as they're announced. So make sure if you're if you're interested in that, you have the Bleacher Report app. You can follow me um, on there on there and be aware whenever I go live. So check that out. I'm going live all the time, usually like a couple times a week here, week here coming forward. So check that out. And then, um, you know, we'll start doing some other stuff. I've got to give you my stat projection podcast. we got to get to herd mentality this week. I've got a couple of guests lined up. So a lot going on here on Lockdown Bills. So don't miss anything. Make sure that you are subscribed. Would love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills. And I look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow.